some interest in how it is that I had come through such a disastrous relationship history, such a disastrous marriage, and ended up happily married, ended up happily married. Tandem with a series that I put on my channel, and the second one in the series is yet to go out, but the first one I've already done, and it's about knowing thyself, knowing what your needs are, knowing who you are, knowing, basically asking yourself questions that when I was younger, I wasn't asking. And so that largely has to do with the big difference in the relationship. It also has to do with my naive ideas about what I was gonna make happen, what my goals were, what I, I, had, these, I had these relationship goals and my beliefs as a young woman, my beliefs about what, what, a, what a marriage was supposed to be and what I could, what I could control. You know, I would come through watching uh, my narcissistic parents, who I hadn't identified as such, in a relationship that was not an easy relationship. It, it was a relationship that I basically came to, came to adulthood, a relation, uh, marriage. Um, as long as you pick someone who seems basically compatible with you, you basically seem to share the same values, that you just kind of, it just takes work from there. Okay, well this is real tricky when you don't know that there's people out there who are pretending to match your values. So that was not, that, that didn't factor in at all. So I thought that I had picked someone who, who mirrored my values. He, well, and they did mirror my, he did mirror my values, but they weren't authentic for him. So I'm thinking, yeah, we had differences, sure. Things were, you know, things weren't perfect, of course, but they were pretty okay. And I thought, you know, um, we have at least as much going for us as anybody does. And that it's just gonna take work. So the problem was too, is that in my marriage, I, I, in my earlier life, I was so used to being uh, deprived of love that when he was depriving me of love, it was normal to me. So I had a very high tolerance for pain. So my threshold for pain was really, really high. Plus I was so committed. I was just absolutely committed to making this thing work. And you know, I, and the biggest thing, the biggest, biggest thing was I just could not ever admit to myself that he didn't love me. The idea that he didn't love me was just so unbearable that I couldn't, I just couldn't go there. And it nearly killed me. It really literally nearly killed me. I had, uh, I had a heart attack at 33 years old. My, my heart literally broke at 33 years old. And that was the beginning of the end. My, my, my life never recovered after that. It, it had you know, become loveless and abusive for several years leading up to that. And then once I had this heart attack, um, I had needs that he was just no way gonna meet. And he uh, was able to, it was so unusual, such an odd thing to have happen, that he was able to offer up an explanation that was not true, was not an accurate explanation. And um, he just really manipulated things and worked things out so that my heart attack ended up being something that he used to create a whole story about me and drug use, which wasn't true. And, um, and a smear campaign ensued and, and my life, basically my life from 35 years old, for the first 35 years, uh, there's basically, as, as of right now, nothing left of it, except for my one son. My one son is the only thing left of my first 35 years of life. So that's pretty remarkable. And so that means all of my family, all of my friends, all of my assets, all of my everything, and one son, and one of my, and my oldest child, all gone. Now granted, I didn't, the oldest son didn't, that was more recent, that only happened two years ago, but all the rest of it was lost before I met this second husband. And so I was not at all, I was a different person when I met him. And not at all trusting uh, that, you know, things were going, you know, that I wasn't putting my faith in someone else to make me happy or anything like that. Or, uh, I, you know, I definitely had learned my lesson about that I have to get real in myself and I have to, I have to be able to make my own self happy and be able to be standing here and okay if something happens to this relationship. The, what the coolest thing is about everyone who ended up being narcissistically abused is that we, across the board, we're adventurous. 
we were risk takers. We were. Because all of us have a story. Could have just as easily turned out to be the most romantic story in the world. It could have worked out, you know? There are stories like this that work out all the time. And let me also say that, you know, we aren't alone in our relationship failures. You know, there, half of every marriage is ending. And half of every marriage, every person, half of the people are getting divorced. And of the ones that are staying married, not all of them are very happy. I mean, some of the most dysfunctional couples I know never got divorced. So, you know, I want to say that we aren't the only ones that had relationship failures. But ours were particularly painful, I will admit that. They, they were really particularly painful, particularly brutal. There was no amicable divorce happening with us. There was no amicable breakup. There was some brutal lying and betrayal. And, you know, they, these guys and girls, when they break up, they are out to ruin you and destroy your life. There is, you know, there is no friend, there is no friends after breakups with these people. So I get that, and they and they are lying from the beginning. They're they're setting you up and lying from the beginning. Although I will have to say, I do believe that there is a small window where they're lying to themselves too. That they that they are just as high on the story as as you are, um, and that they just have that. It's just that they're under control of the whole thing. You're not lying to them. They're lying to you. And they're lying to themselves about you as well. About how perfect you are and how perfect they are and how perfect the whole thing is. And so when you end up just being human, that's a huge disappointment to them. So I do believe that there is some level of disappointment to them as well. Although, you know, it comes in their huge emotional immaturity and entitlement and all this stuff. And just absolute lack of accountability and responsibility to to other people. So what I did after my disastrous divorce, and I mean it was really bad, is eventually I became a relationship counselor and it, I actually called it intimacy coaching. I started to really love my life and was not into having a romantic relationship of my own at all and I was single for several years. And this was new for me. I had never been single before. I realized that too. I'd never been single before. Of course, neither are the, nar the narcissists are not single either, ever, for very long. For the first time in my life, I was single. So that was the first thing, and I was really enjoying it. And because I had fought so hard for this independence, because when my husband left me, I had no identity. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know what I liked. I didn't know what I wanted. I didn't know anything about myself. I was so, I was so others focused that I had no idea about what I needed to be happy, what happiness looked like for me, nothing. And so I had to learn all of that. And it was so hard that I was not very willing to go through it again. So in a way that pain, it motivated me to be very, very careful the next time. One of the things that he was doing that he did, did I have in my frame of reference to do, you know, so they were not even possibilities to me to think of having done. So that was, that made me courageous. Now those things were in my frame of reference. Now I knew that these kinds of things happened. I knew that people lied and cheated and did all this stuff. And I knew that I wasn't really as willing to put my heart out there. So what was really great about this was that I, when I met my, who would eventually become my husband, we took it very slowly, you know, very, very slowly. You know, I knew him for Instead of a matter of months before we were getting engaged, we were we knew each other for years. And we had to know each other really well, really well first. And basically, by the time I married him, more, he'd actually seen me through more things than my husband ever had, really than anyone ever had. And so he'd proven to me who he was. And I, you know, so I, I really married him with utter confidence in who he was. And, and he was not the kind of person I ever, ever, um, would have would have thought of naturally of naturally dating. He's very shy, uh, quiet, reserved. He's an engineer. You know, uh, you know, works in computers. You know, really totally totally different from me. But at the same time, he was really expect. He was extremely nurturing and kind and and also because he was in his. 40s and already well um, established. He already devoted a lot of his effort and time to career and all that. He was really ready. You know, he was really ready and really wanted to take on a relationship and a family. And he, and he really needed to be because I brought with me two troubled kids. 
a difficult relationship with their father. They had, you know, and they were headed in. They were we were headed into years of trouble. Um, headed, you know, and and he was al always showed up. Always showed up. Never, never balked out on anything. And I looked back on past relationships. Not only my ex-husband, but also boyfriends, and they didn't have nearly the character that he had to see me to stand by me through anything that was, you know, the challenges of life, you know, and. So, really, the 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 big thing is, and with these with these two episodes, basically these two episodes that I'm going to upload on my channel, basically are talking about is one is talking about getting to know yourself really well, and then the other one is about if you decide you really want a relationship to work, how to handle yourself so that you feel good about yourself when it's all over with. You know, if, if it's over with, you know, if it, if it works or it doesn't work, you're still you. You still hang on to you regardless. And that's really what is so different from what I was doing the first time. I was com I had completely lost myself in my first relationship. Completely lost myself. And, you know, it comes from, you know, a lot of people do when they're young, but it's especially difficult if you come from, you know, narcissistic parents and you and you didn't get a big investment in who you are in the first place. You know, and you didn't get enough love and enough attention and enough appreciation for who you are in the first place you're really, really vulnerable to having that happen. And so there's a lot of healing that has to happen and it doesn't happen quickly, you know? So really a lot of this takes time and it takes investment in yourself. But one thing that I really feel passionate about too is that I think that as a rule, one of the things I really love to see changed is that we don't talk about, we don't teach romantic competence and we should. Because what ends up happening is we end up seeking help um, way too late. You know, we end up going to marriage counseling. It's way too late when you're going to marriage counseling. That's why in this one of this episode, the, this uh, episode that I'm gonna I'm gonna upload, when I talk about what to do if you want to save your relationship, I say don't don't say don't suggest counseling. Don't suggest let's go to counseling. Don't suggest let's work on our relationship. Don't do it. Just don't do it. And the reason is because it doesn't hardly ever work. A and because it's too late, and B, because the only, the best chance you have for making it work is to be focusing on the positive. Not to try and, not to try and avoid a bad relationship, but to focus on a good relationship. And be, be a person that someone would really miss. Some healthy person would really miss. Some person who's not a narcissist, you know? Because a narcissist isn't gonna, they're not gonna appreciate you regardless. They're not gonna notice what you're doing regardless. But if it's a healthy relationship, this person would really miss you. Make it that. Make it so that you're not, you know, you're not arguing, you're not focusing on what isn't working. You know, I really, really strongly believe now, after what I've been through, that that when you're unhappy, there is very little to do about it. I mean, it's like you should not spend a lot of time unhappy in a relationship because it doesn't hardly really ever work. Where there's there's a reason why you're so unhappy. Something is not working and the commitment isn't matched. There's contempt, there's something going on. Because our fuses are long, especially if you are an empathic person, if you're really committed to your relationship, if you have children, you know, all this stuff. If you, our fuses are long. So by the time you're in marriage counseling, it's, it's too late. I'm sure that people will get upset about that, but I, you know, my, I'd like to see some statistics on it because there is hardly, no one that I know of that went to marriage counseling when they were really at wit's end, where it really worked and helped. The other time when we, the second, the second time when we do this is if we go to like premarital counseling, premarital counseling, but it's also too late. I believe it's also too late, I, which I did. I did go to, I, I went to premarital counseling with my first husband. And it was this. It was this weekend away. This weekend, it was called an engagement encounter, and we went to this weekend away. And they had all these exercises and things you were supposed to do. And I was thinking he was so committed to me because he would who would go through this if he wasn't really serious and really committed. And we, you know, all these exercises where you, you know, you talk about your wants and likes and how well you know each other. And we we had it wired. We were the A plus couple in the whole thing. We we left there, we were so confident and cocky. We we're like, we have it wired. We, why are these other people even getting married? They don't know what they're doing. We have it so we are to, we are we're golden. We're good to go because he knew everything about me. Every single question he could answer and every single question, you know, we knew everything. 
and we thought we were we had all this intimacy and all this stuff but I didn't know I didn't know what to look for I didn't know I didn't know the red flags I didn't, and there the red the red flags had already shown up too they really had they got way they got worse you know got worse 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 with time of course but there were already enough red flags that had I been healthier had I not been so needy I would have seen but I was depleted I was depleted and I was I was and I also I also was a goal oriented person and I wanted to get married young and I wanted to have kids and I wanted to do all this stuff and I I was going to make it happen thought based on who he told me he was that he had enough that we were enough compatible that we were enough compatible I knew it wasn't perfect but and that we were I thought we were enough compatible that we could make it work and you know I of course you know when narcissism comes into it that blows it all out of the water that takes you know that that's you're talking about a whole other ballpark there where there's nothing you could have known this these are liars and they're frauds and all this stuff so you know you can't you can't I can't blame myself too much for what I didn't see there you know with some of with some of this stuff that I you know it wasn't like it wasn't like um, I knew that we had these major differences and I just went for it anyway it wasn't that I mean he really lied to me and told me that you know made me think that we had all these things in common which we didn't he just matched he matched my values just you know matched him so I thought we you know I thought he was really committed I but even still even still you the protection from all that comes from the protection from that kind of abuse really comes from knowing yourself so it is true that he was a he was a, a predator a social predator he was and probably still is but I was his target because of my not being in touch with myself so the the protection is that the protection is getting in touch with yourself and having these really high standards for yourself and knowing that you have needs and that you need your needs met and then looking to see how likely are they to meet my needs and if I had asked myself that question I would have been able to figure it out because it didn't I knew that he was never able to meet my needs but neither was anybody else my parents hadn't been either so you know I was used to that I was used to really not having needs I was used to not not even knowing what my needs were if I had been more in touch with that I would have been it would have it would have saved me so I think that the time when we should be teaching romantic competence is like before before dating happens before independence really happens like before driver's licenses before like middle school I think middle school age would be perfect because marriage counselors marriage encounter is too late it's because you've already picked somebody you've already picked somebody and you're not gonna be objective you know you're not gonna be objective and you're already in the mode of wanting to make this thing work if you did this if you did this early early on before you even started dating before you really started seriously dating and becoming sexual and all that stuff you would tap into a whole other way of looking at things and studies show that especially girls that do this um, have much higher self-esteem much you know end up with much better outcomes in their in their dating life much lower cases of depression both both genders both much lower cases of depression um, lower drug use lower um, later uh, more appropriate um, appropriate signs of sociability and less uh, pre, you know really young uh, sex and that kind of stuff the answer is I was I came I was a late bloomer I did eventually meet a really great guy and um, but the, the but the reason was is because I had gotten really okay with not meeting a great guy I got really okay with my life as it was I liked my life I liked myself I knew who I was and my life was working and I was host holding him off for, for several years you know he was really wanting to get you know he wanted to get married and stuff a lot more than I did and so that was a good position for me to be in that was a good position for me me in particular to be in I was ready I was ready you don't have to be uh, you don't have to have your life wiped out and be in your 40s and uh, with two teenage kids before you can be ready but in my case that was the path that it was for me and there's basically some telltale points about about what you would call romantic competence and they are basically three points intimacy where you can be in tune with with each other you can be honest with your feelings you can express yourself and feel okay with expressing your needs and asking for your needs to be met and then there's the next thing is mutual mutuality which means you understand that you both do have needs and that that's okay 
you know, that you can expect that you both have needs and have an interest in making sure that both of your needs are met. And then emotional regulation is the third piece, which means that nobody's hair trigger, nobody's pining away and, and not taking care you know, and abusing themselves because they're heart sick and you know and there's not all this crazy roller coasters of emotions and anger and lashing out and and silent treatments and all this dysfunctional behavior that happens in in these abusive relationships that we all know about the abusive the emotional abuse that was going on in my marriage my first marriage was outrageous and that never would happen in, in the marriage I'm in now because of these things, because there's intimacy, because there's mutuality and because there's emotion regulation. And those are those are things that every person that's in a in an adult relationship, in a functioning adult relationship, needs to be able to do. You know, those are definitely things that need need to happen. And so teaching those things early on, if you get these high standards, if you get high standards early, you're never gonna end up in these problems in the first place. You know? So, anyway, that's just what my message is for tonight. I just wanted to, here I am on the lake, nice, quiet, nice on the lake. Sorry, my little dogs are growling over here. You might hear a little bit of that, but it's a three part series about the first part is about, or it may be, it's maybe two parts, about getting to know yourself. The second part is about how, if you want to hang on to a relationship, how to go about it so that it's functional and not dysfunctional. So that you're not losing yourself trying to do it. So you can have self respect and so that, so that whether it works or it doesn't work, the memory they have of you, a healthy person will have of you, because a narcissist will make up the memory of you, but a healthy person will have of you, is that you were a, basically a good person who was confident and strong and knew who they were. Thanks a lot. I'll talk with you later. Bye-bye.